Good evening, and thank you all for being a part of YALSA's Morris Award presentation. I'm Amanda Barnhart, president of the Young Adult Library Services Association. We are here this evening to honor our 2021 William C. Morris Award winner and finalists. I would like to take a moment to welcome the award-winning authors who are here with us this evening. We have Morris winner Kiri McCauley and Morris finalists Echo Brown, Christina Hammonds-Reed, Nina Kenwood, and Isabel Ibanez. I am now going to turn the program over to YALSA's William C. Morris Award Chair, Melissa. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. YALSA's William C. Morris Award, first awarded in 2009, honors a debut book published by a first-time author, writing for teens and celebrating impressive new voices in young adult literature. The award's namesake is William C. Morris, an influential innovator in the publishing world and an advocate for marketing books for children and young adults. Bill Morris left an impressive mark on the field of children's and young adult literature. He was beloved in the publishing field and, and the library profession for his generosity and marvelous enthusiasm for promoting literature for children and teens. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce my, to introduce my fellow committee members and to thank them for all their hard work. Megan Darling, Laura Irwin, Megan Garrett, Jamie M. Gregory, Lindsay Helfrich, Alicia Kalan, Carol Maples, and Ann Pekacek. Our first award of the evening goes to Echo Brown, author of Black Girl Unlimited, The Remarkable Story of a Teenage Wizard. Published by Christy Ottaviano Books, Henry Holt, and, Henry Holt and Company Books for Young Readers in an imprint of Macmillan Children's Publishing Group. In this beautifully written, unflinching tale, Brown relays her wizarding journey of hope and self-awareness as a young Black woman growing up on Cleveland's east side. Using magical realism, Brown explores the intersection of racism, poverty, sexual assault, and the intergenerational trauma, as well as the strength and power that women wield as they navigate these challenges. Please welcome Echo. Okay, should I do my, I do my, okay. <clears throat> In 2020, I almost died. My kidneys shut down due to lupus while I was living in Paris, France. For the first time in my life, I had to face my own immortality. I was two or three days away from dying due to the buildup of toxins in my blood. The threshold of death is an interesting place. It sets your entire life into perspective. You start to ask questions like, what have I been doing with myself down here all this time? Why haven't I told the people that I love how much I love them? What have I been waiting for? Suddenly, only the big things matter. All those small things we focus on day to day fall by the wayside. Writing books is a big thing for me now, which is ironic since it was never my plan to become an author. Yet I have been called to this work by through no effort of my own. It was a young editor at Macmillan who convinced me to write YA novels. So you can thank her also for this book. Together we mine the caverns of my soul and childhood. What emerged was my life story, the depths of the trauma I lived through as a child and magic, so much magic. The magic was the only way to elevate the suffering of the characters and explain concepts, feelings, and experiences that are very hard to translate into words. Words often fail our lived experiences as it's difficult to explain what's happening in this world. Magic, however, opens the door to the other realms, the spiritual, which I believe is running the show. I always thought writing a book would be hard, a torturous feat, but this book just came right out. I'm not exaggerating when I say I feel like I didn't even write it. I became a channel for some higher perspective that was coming through me. All I had to do was get out of the way and listen, and the words just came. It felt like a dialogue with the beyond. There was no struggle or fight, but only an allowing. 
I did not attempt to make the text conform to what I thought it should be. I let it be what it wanted to be. I will never not be proud of this book for painting a clear picture of what it's like to be poor, black and female in this country. I received an email from a young woman the other day who wrote, I just finished listening to the audiobook and I'm so overcome with emotion right now. Never have I had a book speak to my spirit before. Listening to the book shook something up inside me and inspired a kind of hope I didn't think was possible for me. Thank you so much for seeing girls and women like me. Thank you so much for giving a voice to an experience that is very hard to put into words. Most importantly, thank you for your contribution to my healing. This is why I can't stop now. This is also why even when I was dying in the hospital, I knew I had to finish my second book. I told my agent it would be my final contribution to this world if these were my last days. That is how important this calling is to me now. It is really all I have if I'm being truthful. My words will be my only legacy that I ever existed and that I overcame every obstacle set in my path. For so long, people like me could not tell our own story. It was told for us by others who could not understand us. They and their misunderstandings conjured wicked and wrong tales about who they thought we were. They said we were savages because they couldn't understand the nature of light. They said we were ugly because they couldn't behold such beauty without supreme jealousy. They tried to bury us because they didn't know we were seeds. This book is the seed of my struggle. Let it be planted in the souls of all that need it most. Let it set fire to every marginalized heart asking the universe, do I belong? Am I something? Let the answer be a resounding yes. Let this book be a blueprint for understanding the resilience and brilliance it takes to rise from impossible circumstances. Let it be a reminder that nothing can stop the ascent of a person or people determined to rise. The rise is called and prophesied by the beyond and the call can never be prevented, no matter how many centuries it may take to answer. Thank you for nominating me for this award. Thank you, Echo. Our next award of the evening goes to Christina Hammonds Reed, author of The Black Kids, published by Simon & Schuster Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Simon & Schuster Children's Publishing. Set against the LA riots in 1992, this historical yet timely novel follows Ashley through her senior year at a predominantly white, privileged school and wealthy neighborhood. Pulling away from her white friend, she gravi gravitates towards the group of black students and it identifies how racial bias, microaggressions, and her own complicity shape her relationships at home and school. Hammond Reed's honest, vivid descriptions of a city in chaos mirror Ashley's own journey as her detached tone begins to crumble on her path towards growth and awakening. Please welcome Christina. Hi, everyone. I'm so nervous right now. I'm actually shaking. You can't tell, <laughs> but here I go. Ashley Bennett is a jerk. She seemingly disengaged from the world around her. She's definitely not in the running for any best sister or daughter or friend awards. She sleeps with her best friend's boyfriend and actually accidentally starts a potentially life destroying rumor about a boy with far less and far more to lose than she has. She's selfish. She's the black girl who calls the other black kids them, who assumes they are a monolith and thus nothing like herself or her family. Ashley is, for lack of a better word, an asshole and I love her and I'm so so grateful that you love her too. See the reason it was important to me to write Ashley as a jerk was that we still rarely get to see black girls in books stumble and fall flat on their faces. Black girls to whom we want to say can you please just get it together. I wanted Ashley to be to flail, to be vulnerable, 
to be soft and fragile and emotionally unsure of herself. The stereotype of the strong black woman so often denies us our humanity. And I wanted Ashley to be utterly human. Ashley and Los Angeles are on parallel journeys of self-reckoning. As the riots start in response to the acquittal of the police officers involved in the Rodney King beating, and the city begins to burn around her, Ashley is forced to ask herself, who do I want to be? It's a question I had to ask of myself while writing the book. I was a black girl falling flat on my face, flailing, fragile, and emotionally unsure of myself. I'd found myself at a crossroads, jumping from dead end job to job and severely depressed. I'd gone to grad school to make films and after a very promising start, I kept hitting up against brick walls, unable to fully open doors that were never meant to open for people like me. So I lost myself in writing what I thought other people wanted. My first adaptation job was adapting a very lovely and very, very white book. It ultimately didn't get made. This was pre Me Too, pre Blackish, pre Black Panther, pre The Hate You Give. When our stories were still left on the margins, when we were doomed civil rights figures or slaves or maids who helped white women discover themselves or wise cracking police officers, when we were a whispered urban market minus Shonda and Oprah and Obama and Beyonce. There have always been those black people who were able to transcend their blackness in the public eye. When every so often something stunning would slip through the fences and get made and be beautiful, but mostly we were either in the shadows or we had to be perfect or perfect victims. Screw that, I thought. And so Ashley was born of my fury, of my frustrations, of my sadness, of a lifetime of being one of the tokens, of being told I wasn't really black by people who definitely were not, and of all the burdens of representation. And somewhere along the way, I rekindled my joy for writing. I wrote for me, for the girl I once was, for all the other girls like me out there. And along the way, people who looked like me kept dying at the hands of police, of the vigilantes, of white men who could kill black elders in a church and still be labeled wayward boys. And somewhere along the way, a whole generation of us, angry and hurting, found our strength and raised our voices. Somewhere along the way, even Beyonce turned black. And so did I, and so did Ashley. My father dislikes Beyonce. It's all because of an episode of Punked, for those of you who remember that show, that came out when I was in high school. In it, Beyonce is supposed to be decorating a Christmas tree for underprivileged children. And the prank is that this massive tree falls right as she's decorating it onto the presents below, smashing the presents and narrowly avoiding the children. Beyonce's very first response to all of this is to check her nails <laughs> and make sure that none have broken in the chaos. It's Queen Bee's let them eat cake moment. It is an utterly selfish act but it's also an utterly human one. We don't always do the right thing. We don't always express our love for ourselves, our people, our families, our community in the right ways. It's a process of growth, harder for those of us who grew up under a microscope, whether it's as one of the biggest pop stars in the world or simply as one of the only black girls in our class or neighborhood. Thank you so much for seeing that growth, for recognizing the power of the personal as political, for seeing Ashley Bennett, not just as a jerk, a black girl who doesn't know what to feel or do in the face of injustice, but as a character whose journey of self-discovery is worthy. I am so deeply indebted to everyone at Simon & Schuster, and especially Justin, my former editor, Zareen, and my current editor, Kendra, who saw me through, to Michelle and Amy and the Emilys and Anna and Denise. This story wouldn't be if it, what it is if it weren't for the incredible patience and painstaking work that my agent did to get me to be a story that might, it might get it to be a story that somebody might take a chance on. And then there are my loves, my partner who told me I wasn't allowed to quit on myself, my best friends who read everything I foisted on them for decades now and insisted I needed to keep following my dreams. My family who taught me to love reading and writing, who taught me love and who sacrificed much as Ashley's parents did to make sure we had the best shot at success in a world that so often tries to hold black girls down. And my sister who held on to me even as I was flailing my hardest. I am so deeply grateful to you also for this honor. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you, Christina. Our next award goes to Nina Kenwood, author of It Sounded Better in My Head, published by Flatiron Books, Macmillan Publishers. Devastating acne during her adolescence left Natalie with low self-esteem. Now, as if the news of her parents' divorce isn't enough, Natalie feels like a third wheel with her best friends, is anxious about an unknown future after high school, and is confused by romantic feelings for her best friend's brother. As surprising romance begins, challenging Natalie to examine the kind of person her acne has formed her into versus who she really is. Told with snarky humor and vulnerability, Kenwin examines the often confusing yet empowering transition into adulthood. Please welcome Nina. Um, hello, uh, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I want to begin with a huge thank you to the Morris Award Committee and Yelsa. Um, I'm still in complete shock that my book was chosen as a finalist for this award and I'm so honoured uh, to be in such amazing company. Um, congratulations to my fellow finalists, especially to Kiri McCauley for winning the award. Um, you probably noticed from my accent that I am not in fact American, I'm Australian. And my book is set in Melbourne where I live uh, right now. It's morning on a summer's day here. Um, in Australia, uh, we're lucky to have access to so much great American literature. My bookshelves are filled with brilliant American stories and many of my favorite books in the world are by American authors. But it doesn't flow back in the other direction uh, at the same volume or in the same way in terms of Americans having access to a wide range of Australian literature. Granted, Australia is a much smaller market, but I promise you we write lots and lots of books and lots of good books. Um, as an Australian, it can be really difficult to get your book published in the US, especially by a major publisher. Among um, Australian YA authors, there's a sort of prevailing wisdom here that if your um, contemporary YA is set in Australia, then no one outside of Australia will ever be interested in reading it. I'm telling you this so you can understand how big of a deal it is for me to have my quiet coming of age novel about an awkward Australian girl uh, not only be published in the US, but be a finalist for this incredible award. It's truly life-changing and something I'll never ever forget. Uh, the reason I think my book has universal appeal is because so many people can relate to my main character, Natalie's struggles, her bad skin, her social anxiety, her tendency to overthink everything, her fear of vulnerability and her issues with self-esteem. My book was really written for anyone who has felt those things as a teenager or as an adult. Um, the other person I need to thank here today is my editor at Flatiron, Sarah Barley, who read this book when it was still an unpublished, unedited manuscript and instantly understood the heart of the story, the humour, the feelings I was trying to convey. And she took a big risk in publishing it into the US and I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you so much, Sarah, and the whole team at Flatiron. And thank you again to the Morris Award Committee and to the librarians and booksellers and readers all across America who have read and supported my work. I'm eternally grateful. Thank you, Nina. Our next award of the evening goes to Isabel Ibanez for the book Woven in Moonlight published by Page Street Publishing. After the indigenous Alaskan rebels and overthrown illustrian rule, overthrow illustrian rule, the Aminas people are forced into exile. When the Alaskan king demands illustrian Condensa's hand in marriage, Zymina takes her place, intending to spy for the illustrians and relay information to them through beautifully woven tapestries made from moonlight. This lush and descriptive story celebrates Bolivian culture and history while highlighting the impact of colonization. Please welcome it, Isabel. Hi everyone, thank you. There are only a few things I dare to dream in regards to Woven in Moonlight. I hope readers would find and love the story. 
I dream that it inspire other Latinx authors to write about their own culture and heritage. And I wanted the story to introduce readers to Bolivia, a place that is my home away from home. I never thought or expected the honor of Woman in Moonlight to be considered alongside four other incredible and powerful books. My deepest thanks and appreciation to the Young Adult Library Services Association and the Morris Award Committee. I am more moved than I know how to express. Woman in Moonlight wouldn't be here without her champions and cheerleaders. And I want to thank my incredible editor, Ashley Hearn, who fought hard for this book to be bought and published and for everyone at Page Street who supported me as not only a writer, but an illustrator as well. Thank you to my agent for pushing me to write this book. I know there are countless people, librarians and booksellers who have worked so hard to promote Woven in Moonlight so that it could be found by readers. I'm profoundly grateful for your support and cheerleading. To me, Woven in Moonlight has always been about learning how to live in the gray how important it is to seek people and experiences so different than your own worldview. Thank you all for hearing the heartbeat of Woven in Moonlight and for finding readers who needed to see themselves within this story about love and acceptance and redemption. This story is deeply personal and inspired by my lived experiences and dedicated to my entire family in Bolivia. And I'm so thankful to have been able to share my culture and language and traditions with you all. More than anything, I hope my journey telegraphs how much these kinds of stories are needed and that there is room on the shelf for so many more. When I was growing up, I was a voracious reader and I desperately wanted to see myself in the stories I loved. They were few and far between. But in recent years, I have seen a profound shift in what's being published and promoted. And I'm so hopeful more and more readers will see themselves as a main character in their own adventures. I'm so thankful for the friends who have loved and supported this book from the beginning, to my husband who believed this book was special before I did, and to my family in Bolivia who always knew I'd be a professional storyteller one day. My deepest gratitude to you all. I will carry this honor with me forever. Thank you, Isabel. Our last speaker of the evening, before we get into our question and answer portion, is Morris winner, Yuri McCauley, author of These Wings Can Fly, published by Catherine Teagan Books and imprint of HarperCollins. Living in a house that magically conceals the damage inflicted by her volatile father's rampages, Leighton Barnes finds nothing strange in the thousands of crows descending on her town. As tensions mount in town and at home, she struggles with simultaneously wanting to escape and to protect her mother and younger sisters. Through haunting lyrical prose, Macaulay builds a devastatingly authentic tale of intergen intergenerational trauma and violence in society's blind eye that perpetuates it. Please welcome Kiri. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. The town that I grew up in didn't have a library. In fact, it still doesn't to this day. Instead, it had what we called a lending library. It was housed in the old bank and then when that lease ran out, they moved it into a 100 year old farmhouse. It didn't have a very broad selection. It never had the newest releases, only donations often left in torn boxes on the porch. It was run by volunteers and there was a sign out sheet by the door to write down what materials you were borrowing. Although I can't remember a time they ever tried to track down an errant patron. I think they saw it as yet another way to share their love of books by letting them go. When I was a teenager, I lived two houses away from that lending library and I became a regular volunteer. I'd shelve books and do my homework and what those who ran that lending library, who pulled me into that cozy, dusty, beautiful little space, didn't know was that this place was a refuge for me from an unsafe home. I'd tuck away among my friends, the books, and forget for a little while that there was a scary world outside. Libraries have always been my safe haven. And I know that that's the case for so many young readers today. It's so much more than the books it contains. And in any new place I go to, in any school I've studied at, when I step into the library, I feel like I'm home. One of my favorite things of this past year was to see the plastic wrapped and stickered spine of my book in a library for the very first time. It's not lost on me that today feels very much like coming full circle from that little lending library in my hometown 
run by volunteers who had nothing but a love for books and a desire to share them with their community. I am so incredibly grateful to the Morris Committee who seem driven by those same generous notions of books and community today. We are learning now through research what we knew by instinct at the start of the pandemic, that domestic violence incidents would surge with everyone at home. I wrote Wings hoping it would find its way to the readers who needed it most. And thank you to this incredible honor from Yelsa and the Morris Committee, I believe that it will. The little sticker of recognition you're placing on my cover feels as though you are gently placing my book into the hands of a reader and whispering, try this one. We can't be in all of those homes, but a book could. And sometimes the knowledge that you aren't alone is enough to carry you forward. I am so grateful to my mentors and friends, Mindy and Kate and Jenny for cheering wings on from the very start. My wonderful agent, Susie, who's been the greatest advocate an author could ask for. And the entire team at Catherine Teigen Books for their dedication to their authors and the stories we get to share with the world because of that dedication. Of course, in particular, thank you to my editor, Ben, for believing so much in this story and making it a better one in every way I can think of. I'm so grateful to my parents who taught me a love for books by always having one in their hands and my siblings who I'm lucky to call my best friends. Thank you, Andrew, Rowan and Theo, my little family who like to greet me when I walk into the room with the question, shouldn't you be writing so often that it feels like I'm living with a very judgmental meme come to life. They always believed this was worth pursuing with no idea whatsoever that it could lead to this but simply because I loved it. And finally, thank you to my fellow finalists, Christina, Echo, Nina, and Isabel. Your books are beautiful and so necessary. I'm so glad they exist for young readers and it's a huge honor to see Wings next to them tonight. I'm particularly proud to debut with you. This year was challenging for so many people and for reasons that stretch far beyond releasing a book. This was the year we all learned to the surprise of book lovers everywhere that a trip to the library or the bookstore maybe wasn't the most important thing. But I think we also learned that words are the most important thing. How we use them makes every difference because we choose what to braid into them, kindness or meanness, truth or lies. If we're lucky enough to have long careers in writing, I like to imagine that we might all one day sit in person <laughs> on another panel and be asked again about our experience debuting. And we can tell them that we learned all the lessons by releasing our first book in the year 2020, when books maybe mattered a little bit less, but words mattered a lot more. We can tell them that we know what a privilege it is to tell the truth, even or maybe especially when that truth is woven into the pages of a book, waiting for the hands of a young reader to pick it up. Thank you so much, Yalta and the Morris Committee for the incredible privilege of being here tonight. Thank you everyone for your amazing speeches. Uh, we're now gonna move on to our question and answer portion of the event. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time we have remaining. Um, our first group of questions is for all of our authors. Um, so let's start with the first one. Why did you choose to write young adult novels? And what is the best part of writing for this audience? Um, Echo, would you mind starting us off? What was the second part of your question? The second part of our question was, what's the best part of, of writing? Um, I'll read the whole question again, Echo. Okay. Why did you choose to write young adult novels? And what is the best part of writing for this audience? Um, so I have to be totally honest. Uh, I haven't really read much YA. And I honestly never thought that I would be uh, writing books. Um, I thought maybe one day I would write just a straightforward memoir. Um, and then uh, randomly, I got a call from Macmillan asking me if this was something I was interested in. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, I feel a, a little bit ashamed actually to uh, admit that because I know you're supposed to study the genre that you work in. Uh, but yeah, so that that's my honest background. Um, and why do I think it actually is good to write for young people now that I'm doing it? 
Uh, it's just from all the emails I receive. Like you really get uh, a chance to see the impact that this has on melding the minds of young people um, and on reaching them internally in ways that I never would have, you know, I just never would have imagined. Uh, and I think, you know, as an author, your job is to plant seeds. That's really what we do is we go around planting these seeds in people's hearts, minds, and souls. Uh, so when people get back to you, you really get to see how it blossoms. Uh, so I think to be a part of that blossoming process as an author is really something special. And I'm actually grateful that I was called to this work. Uh, so that's my contribution to that. Thank you, Echo. Christina, would you mind going next? So I, like Echo, had not read much by way of YA before writing my book. But that was because when I was growing up, it wasn't really what it is now. Like we are kind of in this incredible moment where books by people of color, by queer people, by trans people, by women are like being championed in this way that they really weren't when I was growing up. So I feel like I kind of went from middle grade straight into adult by the time I was like seventh, eighth grade. And it was because those sort of in-between books didn't really speak to me in that way. Um, so I actually read the most YA while I was in the act of writing this one, or if I'm to be super duper honest, after having published this one, like now I have a whole bunch of YA, but I didn't before. And I've just fallen in love with my peers and how smart these books are and how thoughtful they are and how ballsy they are. Like there, there's so much incredible work being done in YA right now. And as somebody who loves adult fiction, I also think that YA is definitely right up there. That there is, there, in, in some ways it's surpassing it, let's be honest, in terms of inclusivity. Um, so I am just really grateful to have the opportunity to be in libraries and schools. Like, it's, it's just, those were also my safe haven, not from a home that was unpleasant, but just from school settings where I was bullied and, and made to feel less than. And just to me, when people reach out to me or DM me and say, your book made me feel seen or your book I've never seen my particular experience on the page um, or I too had struggles with my sister I too had struggles with my mental health all of those things mean so much to me and I'm about to start crying now and I'm going to stop but yes that is what is beautiful to me about YA the ability to reach into the hearts of young people and to sort of say through years you're going to be okay Nina, would you mind going next? Um, so I read a lot of YA when I was a teenager. Um, sorry, if you can hear my toddler screaming in the background, please ignore that. Um, I read a lot of YA as a teenager and um, I know, I still like think of those books. I still feel so attached to them. There's something about the relationship you form with a book as a teenager that is shapes you and is so long lasting in ways that it doesn't always when you're an adult. And um, that's always yet the age range I wanted to write for. And it's such a fun um, uh, age to write for as well. Like it's such a, when you're a teen, everything's new. There's so many um, different things that you can write about. It's, it's sort of the the meatiest uh, time of your life in many ways to really dig into so many issues and so many things that you can write about. So Val, how about you? You said me, yes? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, I kind of like Christina, there wasn't a lot of YA out there when I was growing up. Um, and the ones that I did find, I um, always wanted to see myself as the main character and that just wasn't happening. So when I sat down to write Woman in Moonlight or just even looking at my career as a whole, I have always been drawn to YA because I remember that was the age for me that I started really searching and asking questions and um, discovering so much of who I was and who I was not and where I belonged and where I certainly didn't. And, um, learning to 
kind of navigate all of that and what I was okay with and what I wasn't okay with. And so um, writing for young adult and getting to explore these big themes while you're in the process of discovering who you are um, felt like such a win to me because I, I think in a lot of ways I am I'm still thinking about that season of my life. And honestly, I, I truly hoped that um, anything that I have learned during that time, even on in hindsight, I, I put into the into the into my book and I'm hopefully going to be doing that for future books just to give people um, comfort that they're it's okay to not have all the answers and it's okay to live in the medium and there are so many people who are right there with you and yeah so I know I love young adult and I will continue to write young adult and exploring these different um these different questions thank you Kiri. how about you Kiri I'm so excited to write for teenagers right now, today, in this moment. Um, I feel like this generation is very informed and engaged and eager. And um, because of the tools at their disposal, they're very much part of the conversation um, every single day. And I, I think that that's, it's an amazing moment in time to be writing for teens because um, you can have these constant interactions and really understand their perspective and understand how much they care about some of the things we're writing about. Um, I really like to assume that my readers know more about me on any given topic that I choose to write about for that reason, because they are so engaged and aware. Um, so then writing becomes a little bit more about saying something that's meaningful to them instead of trying to inform them about anything because they know more than I do. Um, and I just think that they very much deserve to have art that's imitating their lived experiences too. So it's a privilege to write for them and to write for this generation right now in particular. Thank you. Um, okay, let's get into our second question. Um, let's do um, Isabel, Christina, Echo, Nina, and then Kiri. Um, so our second question. Um, this was a difficult year to publish a debut novel, um, being 2020. What do you think were the pros and cons of releasing your books during such a tumultuous, tumultuous year? Um, do you think it will affect your writing moving forward? <sighs> uh, good question. You know, uh, Woman in Moonlight came out on January 7th ahead of the pandemic. And so I got to see I mean, there were rumblings, but it, we weren't experiencing that right now. Um, but I got to see a difference because when when Woven and Moonlight was published, I got to go to events and shake hands with people and, and sign books and have um, those experiences. But then when the pandemic hit, all of these things were canceled. And so um, for me, I felt a genuine sense of, oh no, where is this book gonna go? And I worried that it, that readers wouldn't be able to find it, that there wouldn't be um, opportunities for uh, for it to last or to, to have any kind of longevity, I guess. And then to answer your second part, I don't know how the pandemic is going to impact my writing. I only know that I read a lot this year, more than, I, more than I expected to. I really thought that I was gonna sit down in a haze in front of the television and kind of devour it. But um, I, read, I read so much and I think it was because I needed the stories and worldviews and perspectives and adventure from all these different kinds of voices. And so um, I'm hopeful that the pandemic um, just brought out a whole new generation of readers. And so, yeah, good question. I'm sorry, sometimes I'm like a little old lady. I'm like, unmute, unmute. Um, I, yeah, so 2020 was a really rough year in terms of not just the pandemic, but also this huge moment we've had a racial reckoning for me. And I think 
my book was released in August. It was originally supposed to be released in September. And there's this sort of guilt I feel in some ways because I think that my book probably received um, more attention than it might have in some ways because of that moment of racial reckoning because people were invested for whatever period of time in reading these narratives and, and saying, let me learn more. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that people want to learn more and to have um, that opportunity for growth. But it also feels like in, in some ways, like people expected my book to be something different than what it was too, because it, it is against the backdrop of the riots, but the riots are not the defining characteristic of the book. It's Ashley's journey of, of self-awakening. So I kind of have uh, mixed feelings on that. And also just because a lot of the panels I'm on as a woman of color are dealing with the trauma of the last year. So because we are on Zoom, it is like, I mean, at one point I was doing like three or four events a day and it was just reliving trauma after trauma after trauma. So it was, and, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if we were doing events in person, right? Like it would have just been like, you do one thing and that's it. So I'm extremely grateful, but it, it has been, I think a complicated year for that in addition to the pandemic and not getting to see people and to actually physically have community in that way. Um, just cause I think there is a comfort in having people around you even, yeah. So that's that in terms of what I think it did for my writing, like Isabel, I read a lot. Like that's just kind of what you do now that you, you can't do too much else. I mean, I was always a huge reader. I think as writers, we all are. But there's something about like, well, I can't go hang out with my friends, so I might as well just read like two books tonight, right? Um, I don't sleep, clearly. Um, <laughs> so I, I just think that reading hopefully will make me that much better. And also because, like I said, I didn't read a lot of YA. To me, it was actually an opportunity to get to know what's going on with my peers a whole lot more than I knew going into it and to connect with those peers in this way. And I think because we are all living on our computers, like I've made friends over the internet in ways that I don't think I would have had we actually not had a pandemic going on. So I'm in some ways grateful for that, like yay for Instagram and WhatsApp and all these things because it's I've formed this new community of people outside of just the people around me. And I, I guess I'm, the silver lining is I'm grateful for having found that community during this time. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, you know, I really hate the internet. Like I hate virtual. I really just don't like it. Like this is torturous for me. You know, like it just, I really just miss live audiences. And before I became an author, I was actually a speaker. I was a performer. Um, and I really miss like connecting with live audiences. So what I was looking forward to when the book came out last year was, you know, doing a normal tour. You go, you meet people, you shake hands. I like to reach out and touch people. And I really like the electricity of a live audience. Uh, what's ironic is even uh, had the pandemic not happened, I still wouldn't have been able to do that because in fact, I was fighting for my life. Uh, so I wouldn't have been able to do those live events anyways. Um, so I think for me, the biggest con is just not being able to feel like I have access to the spirits of people, uh, which I think is harder to, you know, get through these computer screens. Um, and I think the, I guess the pro of, in terms of, has it made my writing better? Uh, you know, I don't really think it's had an impact on that for me. Um, my writing is the same. I mean, it's the same whether, you know, if there's a pandemic or there isn't. I think what has changed is it's made me a lot more meditative. Uh, I've always been a person that's been a little bit more to myself. I have maybe three close friends and my cat who you have met. His name is Baba Baby. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's you know, when you, you have to go into this space where you're just by yourself, you're a lot more reflective and you're a lot more you know, just kind of thinking about your life. And obviously that can impact your writing is, you know, the places that you find deep connection within yourself. So if I had to choose one thing, I would say that it's that it's, it's really kind of put me in the center of myself 
uh, in a way. And almost dying also does that. It takes you out of this peripheral experience of ego stuff. Oh, who's that person? I hate this. You know, it takes you out of that stuff and it puts you right in the center. Um, so in that way, it's maybe sharpened my writing in terms of, you know, putting me right at the core of where I want to be rather than having to filter through all these, you know, egoic concepts or ideas. Wait, did you hear that? Was I muted? No, you heard it right. Okay. We heard you, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think my being in Australia, my experience of the pandemic has been very different in terms of we've been very lucky here. Um, we, you know, have nowhere near the tragedy that has happened in the US. Um, but we, and my book came out in Australia in late 2019. So I got to have a launch with friends and family. I got to do events. So um, I got to have that in-person experience. Um, but at the same time, uh, my book came out in the US in April and you have that you know, just as a sort of everything was happening and the pandemic was such a, like, it took up so much space for everyone in terms of the horror and the tragedy and the understanding what was happening. And you just felt like this is not time to be trying to get people to buy my book or to be self-promoting. There's so many more important things. So it was that um, tension of, I'm an author with a book that's out there that needs to sell, but I don't want to be distracting anyone from what is happening right now which is so much more important so I think that was the big challenge for all debut authors is feeling like how do I promote my book without um you know into this space um for me personally uh we had a stage four hundred day lockdown here in Melbourne um where my toddler couldn't be at childcare. So I had to do my day job and mind my toddler at home, which is something I know that a lot of people in the US have been doing. And I didn't, I couldn't write at all. So um, my sort of coming out of it, my writing resolution has been, I've got to, I had to find, I have to find ways to prioritize my writing and I never want to go for that long stretch without being able to write again. So it really made me go, what's important and I think that's happened to a lot of other writers as well. What's important in my life right now? And, you know, a lot of people are taking stock at the end of 2020. How do I prioritise writing? How do I, you know, make this space for this in my life? Um, let me think. Um, Wings came out on March 3rd of last year. And I had um, a bunch of events scheduled for the rest of the month to celebrate its release and um, get to talk to my book and meet other authors who I'd only interacted with online up to that point. Um, but I'm a huge introvert and I'm very anxious. And I remember when we started canceling those events, I almost felt a little bit of relief, like the pressure was off and I could take a minute and sort of navigate publishing a little bit more quietly and behind the scenes, thinking that in a few weeks we would be rescheduling those events. Um, and obviously that never happened. Uh, so I think moving forward for me, it's going to be really important to say yes to things and, you know, make sure that I attend those things and get to meet my peers and my colleagues in person when it's safe to do so. Um, it was a really quiet year for this book. Uh, so uh, up until tonight, really, it's been a really quiet year for Wings. So I'm so grateful. And I'm thinking about how, you know, we couldn't have anticipated this. And uh, the books that we get to share with kids are kind of like tools that they get to have for whatever challenges are coming their way. And we as authors won't know what those are and we couldn't have predicted this. So it underscored the importance to me of what it is that we do because we're handing them these tools, not really knowing what they'll need them for, but just giving them as much, as much information and power as they can have to figure out how to navigate this world that can be really unpredictable and scary for them and for all of us.
Thank you. Um, I do want to get to some um, more author specific, um, title specific questions before we run out of time. So our first um, question is for Echo. The story structure of Black Girl Unlimited is very unique. How difficult was it to write the flashback scenes and connect those to the other scenes? Um, and how did that how did that fit the theme of the book? Sorry. Um, so actually, I was surprised myself when those uh, flashback scenes started happening. For me, book writing is really a channeling process. So rarely do I sit down and think, oh, let me write something about this or let me think about this idea. Um, it just kind of comes like it's it's like a, I just have to find the right channel and then it came. So um, in the process of writing some of those passages, there would be this kind of energetic internal shift or break. And it would feel like something else needed to be there. Like it just, it was like this feeling that I had that this did not need to be, or this shouldn't be linear. Um, and so then from that feeling, suddenly other parts of the story just started to emerge. I would literally be working on one part of the story uh, and then suddenly I would just start seeing scenes for, you know, another piece of the story. And then in the process of, you know, writing it and putting it together, uh, those two pieces were conjoined. So uh, I, I really never would have imagined that I would have these kinds of breaks in the text. It's just when it was coming through me, that's how it felt energetically. And I just obeyed. Um, in terms of how it you know, fits the general theme of the book. I think it, I don't know if it made it more digestible or not. I think it's a heavy book. There's a lot of trauma in there. Um, I hope it made it more digestible. I don't know. Um, I hope it allowed me to put, you know, uh, more scenes in there in terms of, you know, my childhood and everything. Um, so that is the only way I can think of how it might've served the text and the book itself. Thank you. Our next question is for Christina. Um, in, what, in what ways do you think the setting that setting your novel during the 1992 LA riots involved into a different or similar story than if you had chosen a contemporary setting? So I think there are a, an unfortunate number of parallels between past and present, which was very much why I wrote it. Um, I wanted to root it in one of the first moments where we have this instance of police brutality against a civilian. So like the 1992 riots are in response to the fact that this is one of the first times that we see uh, police brutality on our screens and that like as a nation, as a city in my city, LA, we are responding to what does that look like? What does that make us feel? And, um, and it's not just the Rodney King beating, it's also Latasha Harlan's murder and, and her killer's lack of being brought to justice. It's a lot of the income inequality that existed at the time. It's like the height of crack era slash gang violence in LA. And uh, I just thought that that was a really interesting setting to juxtapose with this pretty affluent black girl. And what does it mean to be in that setting for her? What does it mean for her to be disconnected from um, the larger community and also to be reconciling or reckoning with her blackness in the face of this moment of national trauma, of local trauma. So it, it was never, I never thought of it as a contemporary thing. It always felt like it had to be that particular moment. And also maybe it was a cheat because I was a little kid in 1992 and I remember that. And I don't know that I, if I were to write something more contemporary, I don't wanna be like the adult being like, hello, fellow kids, that's dope. So that was my cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is for Kiri. What was your inspiration for choosing magical realize, realism in the telling of your story of domestic abuse? I've always been really interested in fabulism. And I knew from the start I didn't want wings to be strictly realistic. I wanted it to have these strange and surrealist moments, almost like a fairy tale or a horror novel. Um, and the reason for that is because domestic violence is really hard to write about and it's really hard to read about. Um, so I wanted to put some magic in there to create some space around the issue and 
hopefully let readers walk around it a bit and see it in a new way or understand it in a new way or from a different perspective. And the magic, I hope, created just a little bit of distance. Um, and then also I think that it was a way to mirror the dynamics of domestic violence itself. It feels very set apart from the real world. You know, it happens behind closed doors. It happens in the most you know, private space that we have and it's usually unseen by people. So in that way, it feels otherworldly and it feels distinct from our real lived experiences. So I wanted to capture that feeling of otherness in this story and sort of convey that. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Isabel. Um, excuse me. Um, so how much of the world you created in Woven in Moonlight is Bolivia and how much of it is made up because it's such a descriptive and, and mush world? Um, so much of it. I don't have a percentage for you, but I, so much of it. I changed a lot of the names and um, city names and things like that. But even, even the names of the characters, some of them, they're Quechua words. Um, and in terms of the food, um, it is basically all Bolivian food. There is no made up anything. It's, you know, whatever I, whatever I grew up eating, whatever my grandparents um, had, up, had on their kitchen table. Um, the world building for me was so interesting when I was building it, because I, I do remember having to make that choice of how exact, how, how rigid am I going to be? And I think what I eventually landed on was I wanted to capture the spirit of Bolivia and it's inspired by Bolivian history and the political climate. And so some of those, par particularly with the politics in Bolivia, a lot of the events that happened um, ended up in the book. And the reason why they did is because um, my brother and I were the only ones born here and everyone else is in Bolivia. And so I was watching how scared they were um, throughout this whole process of what was going on in Bolivia. And for me, when I was sitting down to write Woven in Moonlight, it just felt very natural to um, really lean, lean into my own experiences, what my family was going through, historical events, and then try and capture it in a fantasy world where I felt would still be honoring um, what Bolivia is and, and, and where it is today. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish I had a percentage, but it is, <laughs> it's so Bolivian. I don't, you know, it's, there's Spanish and there's a food glossary and yeah, so. Thank you. Um, and Nina, so what was the inspiration to um, have Natalie suffer from cystic acne? Not something we see a lot in um, YA literature. Um, well, truthfully, it was my own experience as a teenager. And yeah, I feel like you see bad skin, but it's always a passing mention in a YA book or it's a joke or, and I really wanted to um, dig in really deeply on what it's like to have really bad skin, to have that experience as a teenager of just not wanting to show your face to the world, to not wanting to go outside. And it, it sounds like it's, you know, it sounds like it's not something that's that big a deal, but it can be really, it can have a really big psychological impact. And I wanted to dig into that. Um, and I wanted to write a funny book, but I wanted to never make the acne a joke. I wanted that part to always be serious. Um, and so that was sort of my, my driving um, aim there. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we're out of time. It's eight o'clock already. Um, so thank you all so much um, for your time um, and sharing this event with us.